Hello, I'm pleased to have the chance to briefly speak to you about the huge impact volunteering for the Macular Society has had on my life since I was diagnosed with macular degeneration nearly 20 years ago. The questions I'm going to try and answer are, how did I become a volunteer for the Macular Society? What has been my experience as a volunteer? Why did I choose the society to volunteer for? And how do I support people through my volunteering? So, firstly, how did I get here? Well, after nine months of various eye tests and scans in my early 50s, my ophthalmologist discharged me, saying all he could tell me was that I had an unknown type of macular degeneration resulting in central vision loss, which is untreatable, but I wouldn't go completely blind. This is, of course, a common experience, and like many of us, I was left pretty stunned and wondering how to cope and plan for the future. My employer was supportive, but I lost a lot of confidence when I had to stop driving, which was important for my job, and I was relieved when I was eventually offered early retirement. Although this would not be necessary or right for everyone, and my son, who has inherited the same genetic eye defect as me, has proved that over many years. Fortunately, the doctor did me a great favour when he gave me a leaflet about the Macular Society, for which I've thanked him many times since. Phoning the Society's advice line was the best thing I did when I recovered from the shock of the diagnosis, as for the first time I had ready access to information and support in relation to my sight loss. I was delighted to be part of a community that was showing me how to tackle the effects of macular degeneration on a practical and an emotional level. So what has been my experience as a volunteer? Well, for me, it has been very positive. I felt very out of control when I was first diagnosed, but through volunteering, I've been able to learn new life skills and knowledge about MD and share them with other sufferers and their families. This certainly enables me to better deal with the frustrations and challenges of sight loss and gives me the confidence to deal with the various services and agencies that can provide help if we know how to find and interact them with them. Sorry. I was very grateful to the team at the Society for all the information and advice that was provided about my condition and which helped me to understand what I could do about it. Instead of just feeling up passenger on a journey I never wished to begin. However, I quickly discovered that many MD patients in my local area were often not given any information when they were diagnosed. It has been most satisfying, therefore, as a volunteer for the Society to be able to get alongside people in the same boat as I was and share information, experience and skills I had acquired, as well as to signpost them to sources of specialist support. I've benefited myself from the Macular Society's eccentric viewing training programme known as Skills for Seeing. So it has been a special pleasure to share this technique and see some people able to do a variety of tasks more easily, even if it was only their laughter at spotting my very white beard for the first time they could see the features of my face. Lastly, but very importantly for me, I have met many amazing people over the years and now have some good friends entirely through my volunteering. So why did I choose the Macular Society to volunteer for? When I was first diagnosed, I was frankly rather depressed at the prospect of steady visual decline with inevitable loss of independence and the skills of vital in daily life and at work. As I mentioned earlier, the help I received from the Society's Advice and Information Service gave me a better understanding of my condition, and I realised that I could still contribute in various ways, even with vision loss. I was enormously impressed by the support provided by the Society in encouraging and equipping people to retain as much of their independence as possible. I also loved the fact that the Society is small enough to retain the personal touch which I really valued when I felt low. Even though it is a relatively small charity, the society seems to punch well above its weight, directing its research funds intelligently where they can do most good in seeking treatments or even a cure one day. 
I was also attracted to volunteer for the Society as it involves senior health professionals in developing its services and publications so we can rely on its advice and information as being completely authoritative. Apart from the national activities the Society performs, the real clincher for me was the existence of local groups where we can share our ups and downs with each other and benefit from everyone's experience. So how do I support people? Well, I've enjoyed being able to volunteer in several ways as it suits my butterfly mind. Originally, I enjoyed talking to groups and clubs to raise awareness about MD, but COVID put a stop to that, of course. I was therefore delighted when the society sprang into action and introduced the conference call system so that I could continue to drone onto an audience without being able to see them fall asleep for a change. When the telephone befriending scheme started, I wasn't at all sure it would suit me. My personal interests are a little obscure, but the society did a very good job of matching me to a befriendee and we have lots in common. Sometimes we chat for ages, but at times it's just a quick catch up if there's something one of us has to be getting on with. I'm very fortunate I happen to live between two active local support groups, one to the north and one to the south of me. Each is a has a fantastic group leader, but it is lovely to be able to give them a bit of a hand using my knowledge from my other volunteering activities. My most novel volunteering entails delivering skills for scene training to fellow MD sufferers. Before being trained by the society, I had no background in this type of work, but I believe it was far sighted of the society to look to people with MD to train others in the same position. Not everyone finds the techniques work for them, but even so, we can often help with advice on other aspects of coping with MD or refer them to other agencies. COVID has been a huge barrier in so many ways, and I was pleased when the society decided to try delivering skills for seeing training over the phone. It's not easy, but it has meant that some people have been supported in a most difficult period, especially for those facing sight loss for the first time. In any case, I find it hugely satisfying to be able to share my experience and the knowledge I've gained from the society, and I always learn something new from the people I meet. So I'm really grateful to have had this opportunity of talking to so many of you and hope that it encourages everyone to benefit from receiving and perhaps giving the support the society offers. Thanks so much for listening. Hello everyone, I'm Carol. I live in rural Gloucestershire with my husband Hayden. Hayden has macular degeneration. He was diagnosed with it 17 years ago. At first, it was a shock. They could do nothing. And then they gave him some laser treatment, which helped us a bit. But at that time, we weren't living together. We'd both been widowed and we needed help. So, he moved in with me, which actually was very early on in a relationship, but we got on with it. We moved forward, eventually with injections, which has helped. But you can imagine, from my point of view, I've been here now for 17 years. And I will admit, as a support team, better known as a carer, which we don't talk about, it is not easy and this is why I've been asked to speak to you today. I don't think I'm a saint. Um, being a support team is not what everybody thinks but you're in it, you get on with it and you do all your best. So here we go. Five years ago I will admit we were going along quite nicely and then I think he must have had a bleed and things went downhill fast, which was tough. No one knows how you'll react to a situation like this, do you? It's very, very hard. He's a very positive person. And I think the word frustration 
is what he suffers from because he's trying to cope with this. And it's exactly the same for me because I don't really know whether I'm doing the right thing or not. But on we go, we're still married. I admire people who've got macula, but you just have to get on with it and sometimes go along with it and work out what jobs they can do and what they can do. I say I just fill in the gaps. I do the fairy jobs, which aren't much fun, but just keep smiling because in the end you win. The answer is actually to work together, which actually I think we do. Friends think we do, but we've had a lot of laughs. I think what you do have to accept is that if you're offered help, take it. If friends offer or family offer to take that person out for the day, say yes. And friends who really know you very, very well indeed will probably learn and watch. So when you're out with this person and you're going downstairs, the they too will learn to stand on the bottom step just to make sure that Hayden in particular doesn't step off the step and finish up flat on his face. This has happened on a lot of walks. Once he fell off his bike, which um, probably wasn't a very good idea. We were on bikes anyway. And I remember one day I looked down, I'd forgotten to tell him there was a step in front of him and he was flat on his face in the mud. But he got up and laughed. We both laughed and went and got a cup of cocoa or something. It's not an easy role, is it, being a carer? I wasn't born for this. I get quite cross. I found it's easier to walk away from him if I get cross or I get flack because of his friend's uh, sorry, frustration. But I do seem to laugh a lot with him. And uh, we're really lucky that we're still together. And on that subject, I ought to say how the Macula Society have helped me. Five years ago, I actually was at the last end of my tether. He was in denial over what was going on. No one apart from very close friends of mine, seemed to know what was going on. So I was advised by the RNIB to ring the Macula Society. The outcome of that was that I was given a lovely time on the phone, six weeks running for an hour with someone called Beverly, who talked me through the problem, was on my side, was great company, gave me lots of tools to get on with things and let me loose again. Beverly is out there as a counsellor. It turns out that she is blind and has a dog and still travels on the train, I think, to London. I really admired her and I'm sure you would too. I only knew her as Beverly. We never met. I think there are other people like her in the society that if you're having problems, even somebody to chat to, the Macula Society are there for you. The other thing both of us have found has helped is joining the Gloucester Macula Society and meeting up once a month with a group of people who 90% of the people in the room can't see. I had planned on dropping Hayden off and legging it round the shops for a treat, but they've got me down there. And even if it means I pass round mince pies and cakes and sausage rolls at a party, at least I can tell these people who really can't see what they're actually picking up. But many people in the Macula Society down there can see a little bit and they're quite good to talk to. They all say, I've lost my driving license and it's taken my independence away. I have to sympathize. I know how they feel. I live with a man who I love, who is going through that all the time. I think the Macula Society is brilliant, absolutely brilliant. They do support me. I've become a befriender. So I ring, I used to ring a lady in London 
who lives somewhere in Lewisham. Her name was Stella. And we chatted for half an hour to an hour. She was 95. I wasn't quite as old. I was a spring chicken in her eyes. We had a really, really good laugh together. But I've given, been given another lady to ring, also about that age, who's called Marilyn, and she lives in Mid Wales, which isn't that far from where we live. And that friendship, I can feel, is starting again. It, I get a lot out of that doing something like befriending, and you might find that you too can do it as well. I'm not sure whether I've been a hindrance or whether I've been a help. I hope it's the latter. I think you ought to remember that I still do love Hayden, even though you wouldn't think so if you saw it sometimes. So good luck to you all. And it's Carol. So hi. I'm Maddie and I joined the Macula Society in October 2015. Initially, uh, I joined my local group as a um, service user, but now I'm actually a volunteer with the Macula Society. Uh, so I set out as the secretary of um, support group in Pembrokeshire. And I find myself now where I am co-leader of the group along with a lovely lady named Betty. I am a skills for scene trainer and I'm also a gadget guide. Uh, quite a turnaround really from where I thought that, uh, you know, I would be seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years ago. Um, quite a dramatic change for me. Um, one of the things I guess really that hits you is the impact of diagnosis. Um, my personal story, I had a bit of a struggle to actually get a diagnosis in the first place um, because I had to fight for a second opinion. Um, just down to the fact that I was too young, she says in inverted quotes, to be having macular degeneration. Um, but once I got my diagnosis, um, I was told that it's wet macular and it is because I am so short sighted. Um, this, this hit me really. One, I was relieved because I wasn't losing my mind. What was happening to my eyesight actually had a name, but I was devastated because at 24, my life wasn't ever going to be the same again. And it's quite a lot to wrap your head around, really. Um, I'd already, um, had problems with my right eye. So I'd lost the central vision in that. And I just thought, oh, here we go again. Um, I suppose it, it, when you get told that you've got sight loss and it's life changing, it sounds really cliche, but it is. You've got to relearn everything. You've got to adapt to your vision. And if like me, your eyesight deteriorated quite frequently, um, that was a lot to try and get your head around. Um, Diagnosis for me led to treatment. So I had something called photodynamic therapy, um, also shortened to laser treatment. Um, unfortunately, the second round of that caused far more scoring than anybody had anticipated. And in December 2008, I found myself being told by the consultant that I was no longer allowed to drive. Um, and that was another devastating blow. I, I felt like the eye condition had beaten me um, because I just wanted to cling on to driving as much as I could cling on to the independence. Um, and when you get someone telling you now that you've got both eyes with some significant um, diminished vision, that you've got to then be placed on um, the CVI register. It was quite a big shock. So basically, my eyesight is at a point where I now have a certificate of visual impairment. Not something that many people um, would like to hear, but it has its advantages. <laughs> I've got a bus pass. <laughs> So I found myself then in January 2009 
yet again, I had a reoccurrence of the fluid buildup at the back of my eye. Um, and I had a second diagnosis um, that actually my form of macular degeneration is something called choroidal neovascularization. And quite a lot of the time it's just shortened to CNV. Basically, it's, it's linked to the fact that I'm short sighted rather than having the age related. Um, and the consultant took, uh, took a risk, really, took a punt on me, uh, seen as how I was so young at the time. Um, he gave me the Lucentis injections. Um, I had 15 altogether. And that was over the course of three years. Um, so within that time, I found that um, I ended up giving up my job in admin, um, jobs I absolutely loved, uh, something that I'd trained through school and college um, to, to actually work in that sector. And it, it was a blow to realise that, uh, that I had to, to give up um, something that, that took me two years to come to terms with to myself is that I was just struggling along. I was trying to um, do my job as best as I could. But even though I had the equipment, my eyesight was just letting me down at that point. And it did take an emotional impact, um, which, again, something that people don't like sharing, don't like talking about. But actually, sight loss impacts all areas of your life. It, it isn't just the fact that you can't see properly or not as well as you used to, um, or you need magnifiers. It, it takes its toll on your confidence. Um, I remember saying to my family that I feel like I've lost a bit of my personality. I, I, I became quite muted as a person. Um, and I think that it, it takes a long time for people to accept things and, and and actually reach out for help took me a long time <laughs> um I think it's taken me oh must have been about 10 years now to realize that being partially sighted is how I am it's not who I am it's not all of the person that I am it just means that I've got to do things slightly differently um I underwent counseling I went on confidence building course I went on a work placement to actually see if I could go back to admin with all the equipment available to me. And it gave me the confidence to apply for jobs. Um, unfortunately, that didn't really come off. Um, I'd had a bereavement which knocked me for six. And when I was building myself back up, um, one thing that kept me going was my love of baking. And I thought, why not give it a go? I, I combined my business acumen with my love of baking to have a, a home baked business. And that that was really good. Um, you know, sort of was able to do that for two or three years. And unfortunately, ill health meant that um, I, I had to close the business. Um, so actually, when when the Macular Society came into my life, I was at quite a low ebb. I felt youthless and worthless and just as if I didn't want to be here not that I wouldn't do anything about it just if I could magically vanish that would be amazing <laughs> um and then I'd heard about the macular society Betty who is our um current chairperson of the Milford Haven group she knew that I had a macular problem and she knew that there were several others that also had the dry and the wet version of macular degeneration. And she said, well, if I get a group going, would you like to attend? So I thought, well, you know, got, got nothing else to do with my time. Let's just give it a go. And as I said at the beginning, I only intended to be a service user. Um, but I, I find myself as a volunteer um, there's such a satisfaction in helping other people, whether you've had uh, sight loss for a number of years or whether you're just newly diagnosed. Um, it, it's good to reach out. It's good to join a support group because you, you can chat to people who have either gone through or going through what you are and what you have and to just share experiences. Um, 
so in the, in the Milford Haven group, we, we've got such a number of characters. Um, and for our monthly meetings, I try and get a speaker or we have someone to come and do a demonstration. It's not always based around sight loss because let's face it, there's more to life than that. <laughs> um, I remember having a giggle with someone about the fact that their partner had parked up outside their local supermarket. They would nipped in for something. And as they were coming back out, unbeknownst to them, there was another car exactly the same colour had parked behind her husband. <laughs> she got into this grey car and turned to chat to who she thought was her husband in the driver's seat to be met with a face that she didn't know. Um, and the, just the rest of the group had a giggle about that um, because that's just one thing that you, you tend to do when you can't see properly is that you think, oh, right, that looks like our car. I'll just get in it. <laughs> um, or I, I sort of confess to the group that, um, I thought, oh, that person there in the queue, oh, they've got a fabulous red coat. The closer I was getting, I realised that it was actually a post box and not someone in a red coat. Um, it's just little things that get us by. Um, there's all sorts of equipment that we talk about in our meetings and not all of it um, needs to be high tech. Not all of it needs to be expensive. Something simple as bright coloured tape round you know, a coat hanger for your navy trousers or something will, will let you know which colour you're getting out so that you don't end up mismatching. Um, and groups have actually, you know, sort of like shared um, experiences within their lives. We found out that someone single-handed sailed around the UK. Um, another lady, um, you know, sort of the way that she um, moved around a lot. She, she was a teacher. She then explained to us the fact that she remembers living in The Hague and how people remember the war and just little bits and pieces that you wouldn't necessarily know about somebody um, just, just from looking at them. And I, I find that really fascinating. Um, the Macula Society itself, um, you know, provide great support, great help. There's an advice line that you can call. There's befriending services. There's counselling, which are done over the phone. There's also um, phone meetings that are done through the regions of Wales. And, and it all actually helps everybody in, in a small way um, because re reaching out, I think, is the hardest thing to do. Um, and in actual fact, um, I had somebody get referred to me uh, from a local visual aid assessor. And this gentleman um, was suffering from, well, no, that's not the right word. This gentleman was diagnosed with um, dry macula four years ago, and he's only recently made the decision to give up driving. Um, he was laughing the other day to me over the phone that he's got a bus pass, um, and it's really strange having to wait for transport instead of just getting behind the wheel and taking himself wherever he needs to go. Um, he said that getting used to using the um, equipment from the low vision aid service um, is difficult because you're so used to be able to just pick up something and look at it and read it. And yet when he picks up the newspaper, it's just a bunch of swirls until he uses his magnifier. So we were chatting and I was telling him about my experiences and he said to me that our support group in Milford Haven sounds like just the thing that he's been looking for, um, somewhere where he can go and share experiences, somewhere where he can chat to someone about his problems or his concerns um, and, you know, get tips from other people. Um, we were just sharing a few weeks ago, um, someone had a problem trying to put a plug into a socket and it was driving them nuts because they were just like spinning around and they couldn't get the top pin in. Uh, so one of the members said, well, why don't you use a bump on? So that's just a tiny little adhesive um, button, if you like, made out of rubber. 
and they either come in squares, triangles or circles. And she said, oh, well, all you need to do is put, a, put one on the plug and one on the socket and then you just have to feel to line the bump ponds up. That's one of the great things about volunteering and running a support group is the fact that the help doesn't just come from me. The help just doesn't come from the Macular Society um, or other sight loss organisations. It actually comes from the members where they want to help each other. And, and, I, and I think that's, that's great. So being a volunteer for the Macular Society has, has helped me far more than uh, I, I ever thought that it would. Um, the confidence and self-esteem that I've gained back and the fact that I get to help others make their, their lives slightly easier. That's exactly what I trained in, in admin for was, was to be of use to somebody. Um, I hope that my clip um, has helped some of you watching today and uh, I really wish you all the best and I hope that you enjoy the rest of the conference.